very heavily involved in the educational space. Uh, prior to Pearson, Adrian was the uh, university technology officer at Arizona State University. Uh, prior to that, he was a, a professor at Iowa State University, and uh, he was also general manager of a large software uh, development firm, engineering uh, animation uh, in, in the 90s. Um, a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge uh, in this area. Uh, so certainly I'd like to introduce Dr. Adrian Senior. Uh, the best thing I can say about him is my colleague, he's my mentor, and he's my friend. So um, I recognize a lot of you from this morning. Appreciate you coming back. I know Max made the day. Um, <laughs> nice. Um, I had such a great time today meeting and focusing on this campus, talking about technology, education, learning, what the future of those things might be, where it might go. And so I'm hoping to do for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour is continue that conversation. course was the future. And this question about whether we should expect the future to be different or not. Now you're the employee of this president. You want to talk, I mean you might have much to say as president and president of Dow, I don't know, you're not a boss. But you're a boss, right? So you're your president of this big job. And I think he has a really good handle on on some of the pressures that he's he's under. You know he talked a little bit about uh, smart and there'll be lots of technology and, and you won't always go to, it'll all be different. And so we, we, we kind of talked in that very optimistic, positive vein for a bit. And then I said, uh, so which year will that happen? Like, is that going to happen next year? Because probably not, right? I mean, the budgets for next year, we pretty much know where they're going to go, right? And like, I don't hear them closing the bookstore down. And so, I don't see what role the bookstore would play in distributing e-texts. I don't really see how that would work. And so, you know, and, and all the books that are being signed for next fall, they're already picked, and they're all print. So not next year. So the year after then? Well, probably not. I mean, you know, investments and trajectories, and why is the faculty interested? And so suddenly, you start walking yourself out to 10 years. This is what I think the risk is. Um, let, me, let me explain. What I mean here, I'm going to pick one of my favorite pictures. Here we go. Um, this is what I call the Laura Engels test. Uh, take Laura Engels and put her in the target. Right? She's like, what is this place? I don't know what any of these things are. I recognize the clothes, but like everything else in here, these vacuum cleaners, what are those? And what are all those people doing up with those computers with those beeping sounds? What are, the, what are these things? And why do people let you walk out of the store with goods when you hand them over? I, they, she wouldn't understand it as a store. She wouldn't understand the highway. It wouldn't look like a road to her. She'd be like, I don't get it, all these things. And the car, how do I get in it? How do I work it? It's not a buggy. It's not a car. The only thing she would understand, oh, school she would get right away. No sweat. She'd come in, sit down, pull out her plaid, just like every, oh, maybe not. Pull out her pad. Get ready for the teacher to talk, listen until she got bored, then fall asleep like we all do. That's what she would do. And you wonder, maybe it will never change. You know, how many, how many of you, you're, so I see some gray hair out there. Not here, but out here. How many of you have heard before, oh, e-texts, they're coming, they're taking over the world. I've heard it for 15 years. 
But I actually think, and it might just be because I'm crazy, but I actually think that we're at a different place than we've ever been before, and it's really about to happen. This is one of the reasons it's really about to happen. Because if we don't do something really soon, there won't be any more runway left. So one of the reasons it's got to change is because it's got to change. This idea that we explored this morning that, hey, maybe, we've done, maybe this is it. Maybe the way we teach, the reason it hasn't changed is because it's as good as it can possibly be. This is it. It's the pinnacle. And so it just can't change. That's why it hasn't. Boy, if that's true, we're in for a world of hurt. Because right now, I don't know what it's like in Idaho. It might be different. I'm going to show you what it's like in Arizona. There's 100 ninth graders. That's how many get out of high school. Oh, boy. I don't know how that makes you feel, but I just get a sinking feeling. Because I remember that getting out of high school, graduating high school, I didn't feel like I could do anything. But not getting out of high school, like what kind of start do you have? OK, so those people, they're left by the side of the road. What's next? Wow, are you kidding me? I just saw your head go back like this. Because it, it, it like makes your knees go weak. I showed this to my kids, both of whom are going to, one of whom has graduated high school, the other who will. They couldn't believe it. But I didn't make these numbers up. Go to any place, look at anywhere. This is what's happening. Wow, so, so what's next? Yike. Really? Are you serious? One in 10? Who's going to pay for my retirement? <laughs> like, this matters to me. I need these people to be more productive than this. This is terrifying. Especially when you think about, well, what's the job opportunities for these people? Like, what do they do? If computers can play Jeopardy, what do they do? Like, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. So we have to find some way to do something fundamentally better. People we can't educate today, we have to find some way to educate tomorrow. People who can't learn math today, we have to find some way to teach them math tomorrow. In the same way that when we weren't a literate society, we had to find a way to make people be literate, to move from a, a level where 10% of the population was literate to a level where 90% of the population was literate because the world changed. Agricultural jobs, you didn't have to be literate. Even basic factory jobs, you did have to be literate. You had to be able to read the sign that said, don't put your hand in the machine. And we had to figure that out, and we did. And so one of the reasons I'm optimistic is because necessity is the mother of invention, we will. Here's the other reason. I actually don't know how popular the president is up here. But I think we can all agree on this. Education is the economic issue of this age. This is the story. And if you look at the statistics, things coming out of China, things coming out of Europe, how do you think we're doing? We're still doing pretty good in higher ed. But in K-12, we're nowhere. We're nowhere and we're falling. And it's, it's, it's a disaster. It, it can't be. We can't make it work this way. Because that's true. The unemployment rate, if you don't go to college, if you don't, like all other things being equal, you don't work if you don't go to college. And if you do go to college, you've got a much better shot. Now, maybe it gets better when the economic boom that we're all waiting on comes back. Why is it a jobless recovery? It isn't just because nobody in Washington knows what to do. It's also because the world is changing. Industries can move from, capital, from, from labor intensive to capital intensive very quickly. And they can produce better profits, better products, without tooling up those workers that they used to need. And so every one of these cycles, we move from needing labor to needing labor less, to needing labor less still, and to being able to get labor elsewhere. And so fundamentally, if we want to be the kind of country we want to be, this is a problem we have to solve, and we're not doing it. 
Like, you couldn't say we are doing it. But if we don't, this is real. We'll lose. It is possible to lose, and we'll lose. And I don't think we want to lose, so I think we'll figure it out. Here's the other reason that I think it's going to change. Because I think we're right on the brink because of six trends. We're right on the brink of being able to actually have technology make a difference in this industry. We are on the brink. Now, you know, I know you've heard this before. But imagine, think of all, I was talking with the, the CFO today. And she said, I used to be in the banking industry. And I can't help but remember the transition the banking industry went through. The banking industry reminds me, the way education is today, reminds me a lot of what the banks used to be like. Now think about the bank. When was the last time you, you used to go to the bank? I can go to the bank on the fact that you used to go to the bank. <laughs> like who goes to the bank? People bank on the internet, right? You bank with your phone. You bank through aggregator sites. I mean, who goes to the bank? You can buy mortgages on the internet. No one goes to the bank. And the nature of banking as a result, completely different. But there were people right up until the time it changed, and some banks went out of business because they refused to change, believing that, no, 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 this is money. People will never change how they handle their money. No, no, no. This is a basically human enterprise. It's based on trust. It's not got to forgotten. Mists of history. I predict the same thing's coming for education. Now, you know, people always say, you, you're such a radical. You're a dreamer. You're a nutcase. If you think it's going to change, you're, you're kidding yourself. It will always be the way it is. People are always going to want to come to school. It's all about faculty interacting with students in rooms just like this. It's always going to be this way. And what I'm telling you is, you better be wrong and I better be right. Because if you're right, we simply can't afford to meet the challenges that are ahead of us. Because if the higher education index continues to outstrip the consumer price index, as it has for the last 25 years, there's only one outcome that that leads to, and that's that one person gets to go to college. So that can't keep going on. Now, I'm not saying that that means that the tuition increases are over, because they're not. It's a complicated world. But I'm telling you, they can't continue forever. Moreover, we're not getting better. We're not getting bigger. How are most institutions coping? They put enrollment caps on, like Harvard. What makes Harvard great? I'll tell you what makes Harvard great. You're not going there. And you don't go, and we don't want you, and we don't need you, and no, 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 no. And that's what makes Harvard great. Same number of people are going to Harvard now as went in 1950. They're not going to solve anything about the future of higher education. Those challenges we were just talking about, they're irrelevant to those things. The institutions that are going to change it are institutions like yours that are young and that have the opportunity to become the institutions that define the institutions of the 21st century, not imitate the institutions of the 20th century. Did I say that wrong? 21st century. You guys will be the 21st century universities. You came of age very late in the last century. You still got tons of growing to do. And technology is the way that it will change. Because in the absence of that, what other goose in our society gives golden eggs? Do you see what I mean? Like, where else do we expect to solve problems? Why are we in all panicked that we're running out of oil? Anybody panicked that we're running out of oil? Why not? Why aren't you terrified that we're running out of oil? Like, we all know we're running out of oil. And even if we weren't running out, we'll destroy the planet by burning it all up. So, and China's appetite for oil, and India's appetite for oil, like, why aren't you terrified? Why aren't you terrified? Never think about it? We'll find another solution. We know we're going to fix that. We know we're going to fix that. We're not even, we, we don't even give it a thought. We're not sure if it'll be wind, or geo, or or wind up cars, or whatever it'll be, but we know that we can make technology solve those problems. We know that the iPad will be an amazing device, more magical than it already is a decade from now. You know it, because the society you've lived in has given those gifts 
over and over and over again. We're so used to it. We know these things are going to happen. You know that TV. How many of you still have cable? Wait, let's try, let's try another one. How many of you still have a landline in your house? Really? What? <laughs> Don't you watch the Vonage commercials? Do you not understand what's happening? Do you know how many people have given up their landlines in the last two years? Do you realize? So when I come back here a year from now and I ask you that same question, hardly anybody in here is going to have a landline. And then the question I'm going to ask you is, how many of you have dumped cable? How many of you have dumped cable? Ha uh ha. -huh. There you got what, you know what that one is? Early adopter, right there. <laughs> Leading edge of the curve, right there. Because cable's a dinosaur. Because the ability to get, now maybe you gave it up because you just don't watch TV anymore. That's the other thing. Maybe you're a laggard. <laughs> Which way is it? Because I got to know. It's, she's, a la she's done with TV. Reading by candlelight now? <laughs> she pulls out her badge of the future. See that? OK, so here's the thing, right? We know those industries are going to change. We're totally addicted to it. But somehow, in education, we just can't see our way to how it could work. I think it can work, and I think it's based on these six trends. And now I'm going to describe them to you. Now, one of them I already talked about. One of them I already talked about. But let me talk about it in a little different way. What I've said is, universities used to be leaders in information technology. Now they're laggards, and so they need to get out of the business. As quickly as possible, Universities need to stop providing their own information technology. They need to begin to work with consumer providers. Why do I say this? For the same reason I wouldn't advocate you build a power plant to generate your own electricity. Because you don't do it at the right scale. And your institution already knows this. Because, for example, when you adopted Google, instead of your homegrown email so solution, apart from I understand some unevenness when you first got it started, the quality of the service is much higher than what you were able to deliver yourself. The quotas that you have, the other available technologies, doc sharing, video chat. <laughs> and your IT people could never have done that. Because let's face it, who's the most hated people on campus? Parking, number one. <laughs> right? We can all agree on something. Parking, number one. Number two, IT. No question about it. Every campus in the country hate IT. Why? Because we, we want to rely on it. And we can't. And we've come to rely on it. Like you, when, if Google is down for four hours, head for the canned food. Right? Like batten down the hatches. Something very serious is wrong in the country. Head for the canned food. But if Blackboard is down for four hours, whatever. Up, down, in, out. It's just the way that local IT works. And so getting out of this IT, this is critical. And companies are doing this. Institutions are doing this. The city of Los Angeles is doing it. Everybody's doing it. So that switch, I think it's really important. The other reason it's important is it takes the focus off the old and puts the focus on the new. Instead of focusing on the direct provisioning of services that everybody already has, you've got to start thinking about what are these services for, what do they do, how do they change pedagogy, how do we change the institution, how do we make it easier to go to school here, how do we increase the reach, how do we... We've got to work on those things. And we can. And those things are beginning to happen. When you think, when you think about the technologies that are available for free, and those of us, again, with the gray hair who remember trying to build those services, like video streaming. Somebody in here must have, in the 1990s, late 1990s, been responsible for setting up video streaming here. And it's like, oh, give me a million dollars in six months, I'll be, I'll be ready to go. And then I need another million in another six months. It's really hard, and it's very expensive, and oh my god, what if other people use the video? Then well, this video is so big. And then YouTube comes along. And like, can you fathom it? You know what I mean? Can you fathom it? Can you realize how much content is just, like they just keep every stupid thing that anybody uploads up there around the entire world in a completely fearless way? It's unbelievable. And it costs nothing. Right? Like it costs nothing. So something really big is happening. 
something really, really big is happening. And so being able to take advantage of these things, instead of trying to maintain and replicate those things yourself, it's key. It's absolutely key. All right, so we talked about that already. So now let's talk about the next trend. Let me skip forward here a little bit. You know, I really should have this in my hand. OK. So now I think the next one I'm going to talk about is social. Now this, this just blows me away. How many of you are on Facebook? OK, once again, my friend here. Mr. Landline, no Facebook either. You have Facebook. What do you use it for? Friends. Keep in contact, right? And you kind of know what they're doing on a daily basis. Sometimes too much, quite <laughs> frankly. Like, do I really need to know what you're doing in Farmville? Like, I don't really need to know that, right? But somehow, 500 million people can't be wrong. So this thing, it's not a, it's clearly not going away. We look at the way that kids use this, right? Our students use it. And we say stuff like, oh, they're always on Facebook. That's all they're on. They just waste their time on Facebook. And hey. There's plenty of things to do to waste your time on Facebook. But obviously, there's something very interconnected. right? They're, they have a way of building a net of human beings that they can interact with that's like superior to in-person communication. I mean, I know it goes against your grain to hear that, but it's true. You know, it's really interesting that the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a marked difference between the way geezers and kids use, I call myself a geezer, the way geezers and kids use Facebook, geezers don't unfriend. <laughs> like, once you're a friend with a geezer, you're in. <laughs> like, yeah, they just don't unfriend. But kids ruthlessly prune their social networks, ruthlessly, keeping them in trim. They're big, but they're in trim all the time. And I think it's just really interesting. Now. You know, I work in Pearson. Pearson, multi-billion dollar corporation. I know a hell of a lot more about what's happening with my social network than I know what's happening in my corporate network. How ridiculous is that? Because I need to know what everybody inside my corporate network is doing. But to find that out through human means means flying around to 50 cities around the globe and then learning who's doing what. And So Pearson, of course, is deploying inside their corporate network, a clone of Facebook capability to make it possible to, to find those interconnections, to understand those webs of expertise, to speed those communications, and it's clear that will have an impact on productivity. It's also clear that we should be doing this with school. But you know, when we think about doing it with school, like we did it at ASU, we used a Facebook app and a company called Integral. It was interesting. We polled the students afterward. 50% of the students were like, yes, about time. Awesome. Incredible. Now I can keep track of my classmates. I know who's in my major. I have, I have like all kinds of connectivity to all the social networks that I'm implicitly part of when I'm really in a physical, real school. But now I have much more visibility. It's great. The other 50% were like, whoa, can you tell if I've been drinking last night? Because I'm not so cool with this. This Facebook, this is mine, not yours. Stay away. Faculty, you can imagine. A huge number of faculty said, how dare you? How dare you introduce this relationship that I didn't ask for? How dare you give me another place that I'm supposed to check to figure out? Students are not my friends. They're my students. I can't make this work. Do you realize how big my network will be? Like, after I've taught chemistry four times, I'll have 900 friends. So there was a lot of resistance there. But there's no question that integrating social media makes technology personal again. I think a lot of us think of technology as impersonal. Oh yeah, when you, when you use technology, it's not like you, you lose the human connection. I think what we're finding is when you use technology, you gain the human connection if you use it in the right ways. But we've got to figure out how to do it. But the point is the capability, which used to be impossible to obtain, is now free. Anybody can do it anywhere, anytime, at, at scale. So I think 
this missing component that has completely caught on and that is integrating video chat, regular chat, group chats, persistent threads, like every possible kind of human communication, all for really like no investment. This is a major change that allows us to have a platform that we couldn't afford before that can change the nature of the kind of experiences we can create in the classroom. So I think that's a big trend. Let's talk about another one. This is where the bookstore comes in. Let's talk about mobile. So how many iPads out there? Look at that. Even the guy with the landline's got an iPad. No, so iPads, they sold 15 million last year. They didn't have a full year to sell them. It's the most rapid adoption of any technology ever. And look, I'm not a shill for Apple, because I firmly believe that right behind the iPad, I was a little disappointed they didn't come a little faster, but right behind the iPad will, will be the Android versions, will be other versions. But the form factor of this device is the future. Now, here's how you know. Any Star Trek Next Generation fans out there? Yeah. What did they carry? Right? It's the 25th century. They could have anything, right? They have, they have faster than light travel and uniforms that don't fit. What did they carry? They carried iPads. Why? Because that's what you'd carry if you could carry anything. Because that's about the right weight. That's about the right size. You can see it. It runs all day. It's connected to every resource that ever existed. It's a turning point to have a thing like an iPad. What, what we fail to understand relative to technology, because we've lived in an era of infinite change, is that you do reach the end. Let's start with something simple. The broom. How many of you have a broom in your house? Of course you do. Why? Because it's really useful. How much change has there been in the broom in the past thousand years? Not a lot. Why? Because the broom's done. Like sometimes we need to sweep stuff up. When we have a broom, we can. It's perfectly, it's, it's perfectly adapted to the human condition. It's cheap. It's light. We're done with the broom. Television is so close to done. It's so close to done. How much bigger can it get? How much thinner can it be? How much more resolution would you want? We'll know more. Know why? Because you can't see it. So there will be no more progress there because there doesn't need to be any more progress there. We're done. And we're so close to done with these devices in terms of what they look like, in terms of what they're capable of, we're close to convergence. And once you reach convergence, then you can begin to focus on what it's for instead of the new version of it every time. And that's why this is a huge thing. Because being able to carry this device around is almost the perfection of a new sense organ. Now, will it improve? Oh, yes, along all kinds of dimensions. Clearly, we're going to be able to speak to it. Clearly, it's going to be able to speak back. They already can kind of do it, but it gets better and better and better. One of the reasons it gets better and better and better is because the cloud can do it instead of the local device. And so we no longer have to be always carrying the local capacity because we have essentially a blend of giant capacity with the ability to see the results of that capacity and feed it back and forth in high definition right in front of our eyes. This is enormous. When I talked this morning, I talked about the fact that typically educational institutions approach the digital divide, the part where some people have technology and other people don't, by saying, well, to be fair, if there's a danger of the digital divide, we must all stay on this side of the river then. We must not teach so that you need these things. We must teach so that everyone can participate, not just the people who can afford the good devices. Those days are over. To do that is to doom people to stay on this side of the divide. Because all the rich people are already over on this side of the divide. And they're already doing all those things. They're already using Wikipedia. And they're already using 
every possible web-based resource, and they're already using Mathematica and Wolfram and all these things. Those people are, if you don't let these people do that, they're second-class citizens. We must go across the digital divide. And fortunately, we don't have to keep crossing it. Oh, yeah, well, this is last year's and this is next year's. Many of the things that we create going forward can last. Where the previous digital creations that we made could not last because they were so dependent on the type of platform that they were deployed on. But we're getting very close to convergence around those things in a mobile way, which means that we can take the normal experience of coming to a classroom, but we can bring computing into it. And anyone can do it. Now, you know, like, how many of you know professors who, who really hate it when their students bring computers in their classroom? Like, there are a lot of professors who say, uh, Chronicle of Education runs a story twice a year, every year, about let's shut off the network in the classrooms. And I believe that there are classes where that's required. A friend of mine teaches at Rutgers, teaches a writing course. It's fabulous. He also teaches a reading course. The reading course is a critical reading course. It's an amazing course. Very small number of students. You're, you're supposed to read three pages and come prepared to discuss for 90 minutes. You're forbidden to bring anything into the room but your brain. And students find it incredibly challenging. They think it's going to be really easy. But suddenly, like, all they have is their own resources and what they remember from those 90 pages. And the guy's ruthless in terms of keeping the conversation on focus, talking about what we're doing. He's teaching them a completely different skill. Absolutely, I can see that. But in many cases, in many cases, we don't want the network on in our classroom because we know that people's attention will wander otherwise. And I really want to ask whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? We can blame the students. Oh, yeah, well, you know, they're this whole next generation, they just don't pay attention and they're stupid and they're not properly prepared and they, they want instant gratification and they want, you know, like, tell it to somebody else. These people have superpowers and they're bored that they can't use them. It's crazy to give a test. It's crazy. In general, I'm sure we can find an example where it's not crazy, but in general, it is now crazy to give a test where I can cheat using the internet. Because as I said this morning, when you come to work, did they tell you to check your device at the door because it's cheating to use it in the execution of your job? Can you think about doing your, some of your jobs without being able to use the internet? without being able to have instant access to everything you don't know or don't understand? Is it not a survival skill, in fact, to be able to constantly use the internet? Do we not see the death of the bar argument? You know the bar argument? Hey, who won the MVP in 1994 for batting? <laughs> they used to occupy all the time in the world with that. Blah, blah, because nobody was encumbered by the facts. And so people could just spend all kinds of time idling away, blah, 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 this and that. And it turned out nobody could ever check because you'd have to go to the library to do that. <laughs> you'd have to spend half a day to do that. Now what do people do? Well, there's a whole ad on it now. It's awesome. They just show people constantly answering questions that could not be answered before in seconds by using those tools. And the idea that they must be checked at the door at school is absurd. It's just absurd. And there's no longer any reason for it. And that's why I think this will change now. Because I think people are going to get addicted to this stuff like crack. And the idea of putting it down will be like putting out your eye. <laughs> and you just won't do it. That's what I think, anyway. Some people don't agree. And they're entitled to that opinion. At least until I can look up on Wikipedia that they're wrong. There's one other thing that this enables. We've been stuck in something I call the Iron Triangle. Here's how it goes. Hey, how come we don't have technology in the classroom? Like, how come we don't at least use e-texts? Well, it depends on who you ask. You ask a publisher, oh, the kids don't like them. Yeah, they don't like them. And the professors, they don't prescribe them. They don't assign them. So we've made some. Kids don't like them. Professors don't assign them. So we're going to stick with print. 
Now, the real reason is because print lines their pocket, right? Like everything about their business is oriented around print. They're taking home a king's ransom. By the way, I work for a publisher. What do professors say? You know, I'm kind of interested in, I'd sort of assign them, but there aren't any. And the kids don't like them. And what do the kids say? I kind of like them, but the publishers don't make them, and the professors don't assign them. So, so we're stuck in the Iron Triangle. But the Iron Triangle is about to break. The publishers, I can tell you, I've been inside one now for six, almost nine months. Panic. Absolute panic. Because they know that the IBM Selectrix phenomenon is right around the corner for them, but they don't know which year. Because they've seen what happened on Amazon this year. That hardcover sales fell behind e-sales for the first time. And no one believes that that will ever change ever again. Right? Like, once it goes digital, it doesn't go back. Newspapers, are you kidding me? Like, don't you feel sorry for the kids who are in journalism? What do you say to them? What do you say to them? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure it'll work out. <laughs> like, what do you say? You know, like, holy cow. Because journalism's completely blown up. How many of you have seen the National Geographic on the iPad? Like, if you haven't and you've got an iPad, go get a version of the National Geographic. You would never buy the paper one. Because, like, you know that, that fold in the middle of those two page spreads that was so great? You know, like that was terrific. Here's this fabulous photography with this, with this fold, and you have to like ruin the magazine to see the whole thing, and then there's the line, and like that's just gone. And instead, there's this incredible, rich, vibrant, bright color, zoom, pan, sco over, finished, done. And everybody knows it. Textbooks are harder, but they're not infinitely hard. And so we're right around the corner. And don't let the guy that owns the bookstore tell you different. Even though when you go and talk to the guy who holds a book, bookstore owner in here? Good. <laughs> when you go and talk to that guy, oh, no, no, no. Students aren't going to Amazon. What are you talking about? That's not happening. Students aren't going to Chegg. No, we don't see that. Professors don't want these e-books. No, they don't like them. It's too hard to buy them. You have to buy them with, you know, they've got a code that comes to the bookstore, and you go, is that how you buy digital stuff? You know how to buy digital stuff. You assign it. It's in the LMS. Student comes to the LMS, either pays through their student account or through the credit card, and we're done. And all that falderall, all that ancient falderall, all that stuff back here about ordering in April so that the books can get stocked in the store by June. Like, think about the trucks and the people processing the orders to get the books in the store by June so they can be put on those shelves in that delightful retail experience that we call the academic bookstore. That's finished. And like, so glad it is, because it's the worst retail experience in the United States of America. And all that money goes back into the middle. And some people will capture it for figuring out how to distribute digitally. Some universities will recapture it because they'll have digital strategies that allow them to share in it. Prices will fall, and capabilities will rise. And it's right around the corner, and I can feel it. Not everyone agrees. And I understand that. So, so far we've talked about three things. Cloud, incredible power for free. Dwarfing our ability to provide it ourselves. All we've got to do is be willing to let go. Social. Incredible interpersonal c connectivity that's only getting better. Like, how many of you have Skype accounts? And like, what prevents the university from telling everybody what everybody else's Skype account is to allow them to interact through Skype? Nothing. And so suddenly, you'd have a free service to interconnect by voice, by video, to share desktops, like that. You already have it through Google, which you also pay the same price for, zero. So this amazing capability. And then, there's no place we can't have it. That's what mobile means, no place we can't have it. Classrooms, bar rooms, subways, countryside, urban side, everywhere. No place we can't have it. And it's, it's not going to be, it is. OK, let's talk third way. 
So one of the things we talked about this morning is that there's a new game in town. A new game in town, for-profit education. Oh, they're evil. Come on, get up. They're evil, they're dark. They trick students, they fool them, they steal their money, they take money from the feds. It's criminal. It's criminal what they do. You know it's criminal and the scale of the criminal enterprise is unbelievable. Because they're the largest university in the United States. That University of Phoenix had 500,000 students. I come from the largest university in the United States, Arizona, Univer Arizona State University, had 70,000 students. And they had to kill themselves to get there. They had to kill themselves to grow from 50 to 70 over a period of 10 years. In that same period, the University of Phoenix went from zero to half a million. And if you want to console yourself with the idea that they tricked every one of those people into doing that, and that those people aren't getting anything except ripped off, console yourself with it. But don't believe it. Don't believe it. Who's growing faster? That sector is growing like wildfire. What's happening in the traditional sector? Caps. 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 What happened in California? Cap. I need to go to school. Tough. No schools for you. Cap. Cap, 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 cap. Meanwhile, on the other side of the fence, <laughs> come one, come all. Prepared, not prepared, we're ready. Now, we talked about this a little bit this morning. The laws are going to change. The laws are going to change. They're going to be regulated. Many of the bad actors will be driven out. For-profit industries respond to those kind of regulations. They change their practices, or they go out of business. They will do what is necessary to make money. And they will figure out how to make money. And they're making it hand over fist over hand. Like I've visited some of these places that I think are providing reasonable education in certain areas. But man, are they rich? And are they centrally focused? And are they active? And if they succeed in continuing to grow at this pace, won't they begin to form a threat to other forms of education in the country, including even the ones we deliver now? And if that happens, won't something be lost? Because don't we feel like we've got something really special that we've built over 1,500 years, figuring out how to deliver quality education? Don't we think that these brands, leaving Harvard and Yale aside, let's just take the state schools. Don't those brands, those institutions, have a different commitment to education and quality than the way we think of the for-profits? Like, don't you in your bones think about when, like, for example, many of you who are technologists here, you go to Educause, right? Who don't you see there? And the for-profits don't go there. And I'll tell you why they don't go there, because they're not going to tell you how it works. They're not going to share their practices with you. But what do we all do involved in education? We share practices like crazy because we are involved first in education and then in an institution. And we want our institution to be great, but we don't really feel like we've got to disadvantage the others. That must not be lost. But somehow, I believe, we have to find the third way. If the first way is that education I've been talking about, that's education first, quality first, a collaborative enterprise among people involved in education regardless of institution that then finds its expression in particular institutions. That was the first way. The second way is a different way. It's a for-profit way. It's an efficient way. It's a scalable way. It's a technology-intensive way. It has different modes of organization. It has different models of efficiency. It has different mechanisms to determine success and failure. And in many ways, they do things we don't dream of doing. I'll give you one example, just an example. It's costly to lose a student if you're a for-profit, because it was costly to get that student in the first place. And so what you don't do is you don't lose students. So what do you do? Well, the best of the for-profits build information systems that analyze the activity of their students. This is real. I've seen this. They analyze the activity of their students, and within two weeks of the start of class, they can predict the outcome. They can tell who's going to pass and who's going to fail. And you know what? We can, too. We could, too. I've done it myself. 
in my own classes. You can tell who's paying attention. You can tell who's not. You can tell who's coming to class. You can kind of tell who's reading the book. You can sort of tell who's keeping up. But when you've got 50 kids in your class, you can't act on that information because you don't have time. And when you have 150 kids in your class, it's just unthinkable. And so we don't do anything then, but they do. Because their information system produces a list of who's not going to succeed. And those people are intervened with. They're intervened. And you know what? They love it. Those students love it when they're intervened with. Now, I want to tell you how this actually plays out. It plays out in practice like this. When your mother dies and you're going to school here, one of two things happens. Either you know one of your professors well enough that your professor picks up on what happened to you and helps guide you through the mechanism to allow you to withdraw. And we're friendly to you if you do that. But that doesn't happen many, many, many times. And instead what happens is the student just drifts right into the wall at the end of the term. And they flunk their courses. And then what do we do? We're compassionate. But we don't change the grades. We're compassionate. But we don't refund the money. Because to do so would be to break our rules. Which is right. The right thing to do is to intervene. But how would you know? An information system can tell you. They do that, we don't. I'm telling you, there's many, many tricks in their bag that we could use. This is what I mean when I'm talking about third way. I'm talking about quality and scale to produce a quality that scales. To change the nature of what that online experience is like. It's possible. Pearson's doing it. Now, I'm not selling it today. I'm telling you I'm not. I mean it. I'm not. I'm going to be honest with you. I can't. Right now, we have one school that we've done this with. I'm going to show you that school as soon as I show you my favorite professor. Uh, hang on. Yeah, here we go. This is the first place that this idea of the third way has come. This uh, is born out of my experience with Michael Crow. Michael said, get me a partner. I want to have a school that's rivaling the for profits. But I need somebody who can invest. I need somebody who can make up for the things we don't know. I need somebody who has the skills we don't have, knowledge of how the for profits scale their business, knowledge of how they use data in ways we don't know. I need all that. Found all these for profits who are willing to do it. Can't align with their brands. Oh, but Pearson, go look at your bookstore. 40, between 40 and 50% of the books that your professors choose one at a time, Pearson Books. So you're already allied with their brand. But this technology that they bought about five years ago, it powers most of the for profits. Not the University of Phoenix, but Kaplan, DeVry, Laureate, Corinthian, many, many of the for profits. And when I say powers, I mean that technology delivers their courses, answers their phones, provides them with the data. They know a lot about how this thing works. And so when I brought that to Michael and, and Betty, uh, uh, President Crow and, and Provost Capaldi, they said, uh, yeah, get them to do it. So I went up to Denver and I said, uh, so you guys want to go into business? Because we don't have any money. So we can't pay you anything. But what we can do is we can build a, we can build a new way together. And we can monetize it together. Because there will be money in it. And when we monetize it, based on who puts in what, we can extend this instruction to people. We can collect money, and we can split it. But somebody's got to go in the hole, because we have to market. At, at, at universities, we don't think about marketing, right? Like, how do we market at a university? You open the door. You put up a couple of signs, Boise over here, right this way to the place with the blue field. And then the people come. And then we sort them out into their houses, and, and that's how we do it. Right? I mean, that's how we do it. That's how everybody does it. But that's not how the other team plays. The other team is out there aggressively finding out who needs education, who wants education, who's trying to change your life, what are you trying to do, what do you need, what kind of educational experience do you need? Do you need this many hours a year, that many hours a year? They're, they're marketing. If you want to compete, you've got to do that too. Who's got the money for that? So this is why this idea of a partnership is critical. Because you've got to have somebody who can go in the bucket. Somebody who can go under. 
building the courses that make complete programs, because otherwise you have to bootstrap. You guys have successfully bootstrapped. You have an ed tech program that's the envy of the world. Anybody in here from the ed tech program? No? Yeah. It, it's a terrific program, right? You have people from all over the world taking courses, getting degrees. It's awesome. I think you have an international reputation for that program. But building it, you've got to like scratch it out of the rock. Right? You've got to beg, borrow, and steal to get faculty involved, to get the resources involved, to get it put together. And then, how quickly can you grow it? If suddenly, twice the number of students that you currently support showed up on your doorstep, huh? Scale. Can't do it. No way. This is what we have to learn how to do. This is my claim. If we're going to compete in the 21st century, this is what we have to learn how to do. And I believe that some institutions want to learn how to do this and can and will. And that's the third way. And so I think that's going to happen because I'm seeing it happen. OK, one more thing, then we, have, then we all get to go. The last one is my favorite, and it's the most important. That's, that's Herbert Simon, who, given the whole conversation about Watson and Jeopardy, is important because he was one of the people who invented the first checker player in the 50s. Checkers, by the way, is solved. Do you know what that means? Like, do you ever play checkers? I'm terrible at checkers. Have you ever played checkers? You play checkers with your grandchildren, maybe, or children. Play checkers? I don't know what it is, but kids like checkers. Because nobody's any good, right? Because nobody really understands what to do. Some people are good. The best humans could be beaten by computers right around 1965, I think. But now, checkers is solved. What that means is there's a table. Every move, every game, every way. And so you make a move, and the computer goes, you lost. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, that's unbelievable. So here's this guy. He was very smart, very before his time, really. And he, in his last lecture, you know, Randy Pausch did the last lecture that everybody knows from Carnegie Mellon. Great thing. Well, it's a tradition at Carnegie Mellon that when you retire from there, you give a last lecture. And in Simon's last lecture, this is what he said. He said, we're not going to get any improvement in higher education until we stop teaching alone. Now, that is fundamentally the academic freedom model. We teach alone. Every instructor, every teacher, every professor chooses their curriculum themselves, by themselves, master the classroom, that's me. You're out, I'm in, done. What Simon said, and the reason I'm using Simon instead of me is because I'll be dismissed, but he's a Nobel laureate, so we have to listen to him. And what he says is, look, be reasonable. How can it ever get any better if A, we don't put more brains on it at, than at once, and B, we don't measure the results in a very intensive way, just like we would if it was a research project. Now, I, math's my favorite, so I want to talk about that. Think about math instruction. I mean, seriously, think about it. It's been the same forever. Is there anybody in here who would say, I'm not a math person? Can I have a person, not a math person, not a math person, not a math person? What does that mean? I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that once there was a math course that you took and you got a C. You know, like, oh, I, I, I didn't get it. And then that's it. The math door's closed to you. And, and we just accept that, because we could, because everybody doesn't have to know math. It's not a big deal. But now we know math, huge gateway course. There's all these career options. Can do math, in the wedge. Can't do math, door closed for you. Increasingly, math, quantitative understanding, all those things, very important part of living in a technological society. And do we get any better at teaching math? Well, like, this teacher might be better than that teacher. Or this teacher's good with those students, and that teacher's good with that student. But do we get any better? Does the boats rise? Like, we've been teaching math for, what, 500 years? Shouldn't it be true by now, by our modern standards of improvement, that everyone should know calculus by 10? Right? Like, why don't we have even that dream of expectation? Why don't we even imagine? Like, because we should be getting better, right? Don't we get better? We get better at everything else. 
metallurgy. You wouldn't put up with it in your car. If you were driving a car that was as good as it was in 1950, you wouldn't put up with it. But we do put up with it in math education. Because there's no vector for improvement. How could you do it? Individual people can get better and then they die. That's it. That's how we're built. But no more. No more. Let me show you this. This is one of my favorite slides. I love this. Very simple slide. I love that one. I do. That's a great one. This is my favorite slide. This one right here. First of all, because who doesn't want to be an edupunk or an edupreneur? I'd like to be both of those things. That's a good book. It's fun. It surveys some of the things that are happening in the inter in the interspace between technology and education. It's, it's cool. Here's one of the things. This is talking about a, a program called My Math Lab. I think it's in use here at, at the university to a certain degree. Here's what happened at Alabama. A guy first came up with this idea in, at Virginia Tech. Hey, maybe we'll teach math this completely different way. Let's use a computer program to act as an intelligent tutor. And then let's build an emporium concept around it, where students can come, engage with that tool, and then when, they don't, when the tool is unable to help them, they can raise their hand, and somebody who knows more than them will come over and help them, get them unstuck, and they'll keep doing that. And moreover, they'll keep doing it until they get it. So if it takes eight weeks, fine. If it takes nine weeks, fine. If it takes 10 weeks, fine. If it takes 17 weeks, fine. What happens? Well, that happens from 50% of the students failing math, and then either choosing careers that don't involve math or dropping out of school entirely. Because as we study retention, we know math, gateway course, they go to 70% passing. Your instinct, right, right away, oh yeah, you changed the test, you made it easier. No, 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 same test, same standards. Hey, you know what else? They like it better, and it's cheaper. Now, how does this thing work? I'll tell you what, it's crude. I've like studied its back end, it's crude. I don't mean crude like it's rude or swears or anything. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's nowhere near the potential that it has. But what it does is it mines the behavior now of about 6 million students a year. So 6 million students at all these different institutions take problem after problem after problem after problem after problem after problem. And the patterns that emerge this is the secret to artificial intelligence in our age, to take the behavior of intelligent humans, aggregate it, extract the patterns, and automate them. That is the genius behind Netflix, the genius behind Amazon, the genius behind the automatic traders, the genius behind Google. Have you ever thought about it? Google, it's ridiculous. They have the whole internet, like all of it indexed. You know, it stops my heart sometimes to think about it. And not only do they have it all indexed, but when you ask, hey, who won the Oscar in 1964 for Best Picture, out of the whole internet, it shows you who. What is that? Like, if I'd have shown you that in 1990, I'd have been burned as a wit. You know, like if you see, once you know the trick, it doesn't seem like a miracle. Once you know the trick, it doesn't seem like a miracle. But, but if you put a different skin on that, and in 1990 you said, well, here, ask it any question, go ahead. Ask it who won the Oscar, and blah, blah, and it'll tell you. Burn it. <laughs> this behavior of math students oh, you got this problem wrong? Not only you get it wrong, how'd you get it wrong? What answer did you give? Oh. Uh, here, try this one. Yep, you can't add seven and five, brother. That's what's going on here. Seven, five, ready? 13, ha ha! <laughs> no, no, seven, five, 12, ready? Seven, five, 13, no, 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 no. Right, and so in this way, what does it do? It does what Archimedes did for Alexander. It watches you learn math right over your shoulder and goes, oh, no, 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 right there. That's where you made your mistake. In a way that we would if we could, but we can't afford to. But we can now, in a social way, in a mobile way, in a ubiquitous way, in a cost-effective way, for the first time in history, right now. And that's why you can expect a world to change in the next 10 years, because right now, 
All the elements are right there. That's how I know it's going to work now. And there's money in it. Right? And there's money in it. That's why the four prophets are in it. Because there's money in it. There's lots of money in it. And there's money all over the world in it. And that's why this is going to work now. That's why we're going to see. But it will work differentially. Some institutions will aggressively pursue new ways. Other institutions will aggressively resist them. And there'll be every kind in between. I believe your institution will aggressively pursue these ways. You know why I believe that? First of all, because I've met your president. And he talks the same game I do. I mean, not as crazy, because he's president. <laughs> but he believes it. He sees it. He sees the same writing on the wall. He sees the same social factors, the same technological factors, and the same fiscal factors. And his university, your university, is young. It doesn't seem like it, right? Because it's, what is it, 50 years old? 60 years old? Am I, am I right? 76 years old, which is young, right? A thousand years is old for a university. 250 years is old for an American university. So your university is on the brink, just maturing. You don't have a huge research collection to tear apart. You can avoid building one in the first place and just leapfrog to what will be. This is why I think the future belongs to institutions like yours. So that's my story in a nutshell. I'm going to keep working until one of two things happens. Either this comes about or I die. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your attention. Hey, any questions, comments, thoughts? Anybody want to take issue with anything or throw down or agree or disagree or amplify? Or... Yes, ma'am. It'll tell you to a certain degree. It'll be the poor man's version. If you're interested in the, in the real version, I'll send somebody out to see you. Uh, other thoughts? Other, other, th other things? How many people have read uh, Disrupting Class, Clayton Christensen? That's my other book recommendation, if you haven't read that. Because I think that is an amazing analysis of where we actually are right now. And it's also similarly very hopeful book, though much more focused on the idea that globally, the appetite for this is so high that it will, that it will pull us in this direction. Other thoughts, notions before we, uh, before we break up and go to our respective ways? Well, hey, thanks a lot. And what you do, so very important to this country. Thanks for doing it.